All right, check this out. This will give you phenomenal results if you've been working out for less than a year. If you've been working out for less than a year, focus on getting stronger. That's it. If you get stronger, you will see visible changes in your body. You will get a faster metabolism. And it's one of the best signs that you're doing everything right. Strength should be the number one focus when you're working out for under a year. I want, want to make sure I say that because, by the way, that's uh, the context, right? That doesn't mean you have crappy workout form. doesn't mean yeah. you hurt yourself. You got to do everything smart. But if all you did in that first year was just try to get stronger with good technique and good form, you're going to progress no matter what. You're going to well, progress. We know what's going to result uh, if that's really like what you're focusing on the most. Like, totally. There's all good good things that are going to transpire from there. And so like just to focus on that as the main metric, uh, I think it's, it's, it's nice because psychologically that's – simplifying it but to to be able to get that to happen a lot of factors have to be uh correct that's right that's i right. wish i understood this when i was younger you know i think uh, and something you should add to that is that this is even as important or more important when you have aesthetic goals because for the longest time I had this attitude of i don't really care how strong i am in the gym i'm trying i'm trying to change the way my physique looks, which I think a lot of people can relate to. I do. I know we have a large mm -hmm. audience that wants to be strong, but they're, I, I would think that more people just want to get rid of their belly fat or just want to, you know, sculpt their arms or just want to build their butt. And I think that when you hear someone say, get stronger, it's like, eh, that's great. But I don't, I don't yeah. think that's really, really important to me. No, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking specifically to the majority of people because most people don't work out to get stronger. They like that they get stronger, but the average person goes to the gym or starts exercising because they want to look better. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, we could talk about, you know, why training for looks isn't necessarily this way, but I don't care about that. In the first year of training, the reason why I said for the first year is because it gets more complicated after that. You obviously cannot get stronger forever consistently. Um, there's more factors that play into it. Your genetics start to limit things. And I mean, if you could get stronger forever, obviously people who've been working out for 20 years would be able to lift, you know, trains, right? So it doesn't work that way afterwards. But for that first year, you could consistently get stronger all year long, consistently. Mm -hmm. If you do everything kind of right, you know, if you get decent sleep, decent nutrition, you're training well, you're doing the right exercises, you're, you're getting good recovery, you'll get stronger relatively consistently for about that first year. And if you do that, your body will look better. In other words, your body will look better at the end of that year than it would had you focused on other metrics, other things uh, in your training, other things that you, if you focused on just the mirror, for example, yeah. if you took two people, one of them looked at the mirror and just said, I'm gonna look at the mirror and focus on that. The other one says, you know, what? I'm just gonna try and get stronger. The person who focused on getting stronger will look better at the end of that year. Well, even then, I mean, if, if, you're just focused on some of those main lifts that you're trying to get stronger at. There's a lot of other um, ways to to classify like getting stronger, like in in different types of movements, in different ranges of motion, um, in different tempos, uh, uh, in, in terms of like endurance with that kind of strength. So, in, in terms of it just being about those specific lifts, there's there's a whole. So if you get in, in, in a plateau and a rut where it's like, I feel like my strength isn't really moving. If you can like refocus that strength in a different direction too, that's going to keep everything else moving uh, in the right direction. That's such a good point because I think a lot, another thing that a lot of people think about when you think about just getting stronger is your PR, yeah. you know, like what's my max bench? <laughs> like, okay, so I should just try and get better at my bench, better at my squat, better at my deadlift as far as my PR. But a PR can be to Justin's point, um, oh, I can now, you know, let's say I could, you know, when I started this journey, I could only squat, say, 185. Well, I'm still only squatting 185, but now I can do it with like a six second negative, or I can get multiple reps out of the weight that was, you know, near my max. Or a before. greater range of motion. Right. Or yeah. better control. Like, I mean, there's other ways that you can PR other than just more weight on the bar. It could be a personal record on how well the weight moves. And so, right. and I think that's an important thing to focus on. So it doesn't get to this where all you care about is this, you know, PR metric, and then you sacrifice things like form and technique. Right. So think of it this way. Think of two people lifting a 20 pound dumbbell. One of them is really strong and the other one is not so strong, but they can still lift the 20 pound dumbbell. How will it look? 
when the strong person lifts a 20 pound dumbbell versus the person who's not as strong. Yeah. So in other words, your technique gets better, your control gets better, your range of motion gets better, or of course you add weight to the bar, or of course you add reps. All of that means you get stronger. I used to love doing this with, and this this took me a long time to to figure out, but when I did, I became so effective uh, at getting people results as a, as, a, as a trainer, especially people who want to lose weight. This was my favorite. When people came to me and said they wanted to get stronger, it was easy because it's like, I don't need to sell you on anything. That's what we're going to do. When people came to me and said, I want to lose you know, 30 pounds, and I'd say, no problem. We're going to get you stronger. It's, well, wait, didn't you hear what I said? I want to lose 30 pounds. <laughs> I know. We're going to get you stronger. And then mm-hmm. I have to explain why. And sure enough, the strength turned into muscle, turned into a faster metabolism, which then turned into sustainable, easier fat loss. Uh, literally getting people at the end of the year to eat mm-hmm. more food than they did when they started with me, and yet they'd lost more. They'd lost weight. Like what a sustainable position and place to be in. Plus, getting stronger feels really good. Even if you don't care about how strong you are, if you gain 10 or 15% more strength, just, every, let me put it this way, I'll, I'll, I'll reword this. If you got 15% stronger, everything you do in life is going to feel 15% easier. Mm-hmm. Getting out of your chair, 15% easier. Playing with your kids, 15% easier. Uh, you know, Sweeping the, the kitchen, 15% easier. So strength is amazing. It's also a great metric because it's hard to get poor sleep and get stronger. It's hard to have too much stress and get stronger. You can't have bad workout programming and get stronger. You can't have a really crappy diet and get stronger uh, for too long. So strength is just, it's this incredible metric. Now it's not the be all end all. That's why I said people who work out, you know, working out for a year or less, because after that, then it gets a little more complicated. It's much more challenging. But in that first year, when you're going to the gym, I don't care what your goal is, fat loss, muscle gain, body sculpting, whatever, try to get stronger, make that the number one goal, and you'll get there faster and better by focusing on that versus almost anything else. So it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's simple. It really is simple. Get stronger. That's it. And yeah. you'll get there. Are you guys seeing all the, the news pop up around the fat loss peptides? Oh, I feel like I, I don't know if this is like getting traction. Yeah, I don't know if there's like one of those situations where when you buy the car, now you see the car everywhere type of deal. Yeah, like um, the fact that we're using peptides, we just got done talking to Doctor Seed recently, and so is it that I'm is this like bias now that I'm like more aware or because I had a family member, an old client of mine, and then I open an art first thing when I open up my <clears> emails today had a, an email like all three of those happened this weekend <clears> all related to fat loss peptides and they're all like client. If, client old client and family like oh did you hear about this ozempic you know peptide that's supposed to be yeah. like a magic magical fat loss no uh, it's it's blowing up so i heard about uh some agglutide and the, uh, Doug, maybe you can look up they're called g g h l g l p1 g l p1 receptor yeah. agonist i think yeah confirm that Doug. i don't want to get that wrong that's what um, the ozempic is too. yeah 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 so um i remember when they first came out and i read the studies i actually bought shares of one of the pharmaceutical companies that made it because it's the first pharmaceutical anything product. And remember, peptides are not like drugs. We, when we talked to Dr. Seedy, explained that. He said, peptides are based off of actual signaling systems in the body. It's not like a, a drug that was created to force your body to do anything, which means they have, they have less side effects. There's natural governors in the body because your body recognizes the, these particular molecules. They're in and out of your system relatively quick. Y- yeah, so it's very different. So Um, when I read about it, I remember being like, oh, wow, this initial research is really crazy because it's the first pharmaceutical anything that legit works and it doesn't work through, uh, like the stimulant. Cause like the old fat loss drugs, like Fenfen, they're like stimulants and they had heart legal crack. Yeah. Like, (laughs) you know, and, 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 uh, they, they had, you know, nasty side effects, right? They're not good for your heart. They're not suitable for everybody, whatever. These ones are interesting. They actually do work. Now, it's not going to work like changing your diet or exercise or whatever, but it is something that people, t- they literally in the studies are like, don't change anything, just take this, and then they'll lose you know, 10 pounds or whatever. So it's pretty phenomenal. Now, that this, the drawbacks are people would also, they would, if, if they didn't strength train and they didn't monitor their protein intake, they would lose also lean body mass along with the mm-hmm. weight. So it was, it, what it did is, although it is lean body mass sparing because it 
makes people eat less because that's part of what it does is it makes you want to eat less. If you don't try to get protein intake and lift weights, you'll lose You'll just lose weight, weight, which not is, just body Which fat. is what would exactly would happen if you did a, a, a caloric deficit, a, a large caloric deficit. Yeah, if you just to, cut your calories. Yeah, if you, just, exactly. if you just cut your calories, 1,000 calories, and you saw 5, 10 pounds go off the scale, but you didn't lift weights, you didn't keep your protein intake, the exact same thing would happen. Yeah, so, yeah. But so, that's why it's making its waves is because the, the data is coming out and they're like, oh, we finally have a, like a weight loss, something hmm. that actually delivers somewhat, you know? What is it? signaling like what's the pathway there in terms of like uh, you know it's doug has it up there loss. it's a gluc uh, glucagon like peptide one receptor so this is something that they look for in, in treating type 2 diabetes mm. so it was a di it was researched as something that helps improve insulin sensitivity okay and so it does work through that process but then it also has this effect of you know, people just just kind of just don't want to eat as much, mm -hmm. um, which I I believe to be the main reason why people are losing weight. So if you're a little insulin resistant, this will help to yeah naturally signal yeah. That's what it was originally uh, designed for, created for. So, huh. um, so it is interesting. The, pep, the whole peptide world is. I, I I'll say this: this is going to be that whole space is going to be the biggest. It's going to be the oh, fastest yeah. growing, biggest kind of breakthrough space in the pharma industry uh, that we've seen a long time. It's like when they first discovered opiates yeah, or when they first discovered uh, well, anti antibiotics. What do you speculate is going to happen? What do you th How do you think it's all going to flush out? Do you think they're going to be uh, regulated yeah, like crazy? Regulated. Is it going to be like we're going to see all these clinics popping up? Well, and, like so far, um, there's a gray market where you could buy, which, I would, which is terrible. This is so dumb. Especially when we interviewed Dr. C to explain this. You could buy them as research chemicals. And uh, and then try to like administer it yourself and create your own formula. Uh, and the the way he explained it is he said um, when they did analysis on these research chemicals, they found that sixty percent of them were the actual peptide, and the rest of it were like undisclosed peptides, yeah, like, like Frankenstein peptides. Yeah, you don't even yeah. know what they're doing or signaling the body could cause all kinds of weird stuff. Um, so it's regulated in the sense that um, pharmaceutical, uh, not pharmaceutical companies, excuse me, um, compound pharmacies. We'll have to make them. Pharmaceutical companies are researching them, mean or and, and some of them are on the market, meaning insurance can cover some of them if a doctor prescribes it to you in that way. Oh, I didn't know insurance was covering some of the peptides. Some of them, yeah. So I believe Oh, like if you're I guess if you're diabetic, you could probably get yes, the Zempic and stuff. Yes, like that. yes, okay. yes. Like Tessa Marilyn, which raises growth hormone, is currently prescribed to people with visceral body fat who have HIV. It's a very specific uh, uh, group of people because it was found to reduce visceral body fat. Um, do they but, not do it in like a, like the elderly population too? Like I, I don't mean, think it's um, I don't think it's it's because they started by insurance. For weren't them. they weren't they doing that for HGH? Like you would get like like somebody who's like really old and like for for muscle uh, sparing purposes, wouldn't <laughs> it, they? The insurance won't cover HGH oh. unless you have an HGH deficiency. Mm. Um, but they're not scheduled like uh, testosterone. So because of that, you could go through like if you went through mphormones.com. You could work with them. They have a doctor there, and then they could set you up on peptides. Whereas, you know, if you if you're going with certain scheduled drugs, then it's a much harder kind of process. So the market is more open in the sense, but uh, you still would want to if you want like if you want it to come from a, a pharmacy, you work with a doctor. Now, do you predict because it's a blowing up market? There's going to be so much money. Do you predict that it's not going to stay right or stay open like that? Like my prediction would be that. Because there's that's, a lot of money, I, there's some, somebody's going to lobby for heavy restrictions around it, and then maybe we yeah. only have this small window right now where it's in the gray area where people could take advantage of it for relatively cheap or easy access, but soon it's going to be yeah. you know, tightly regulated because of how effective and how much money is Here's in it. Here's how you know that that'll happen. If you start seeing them, uh, if you start seeing lots of articles about athletes getting busted for peptides because a lot of these peptides mm. are banned by um governing agencies so like oh i hadn't even thought of that like uh i wonder like so which ones specifically right now are are flagged is probably all of them no well i know the growth hormone releasing ones are are they hard to i wonder if they're hard to trace too because they're in and out of your system so fast it's yeah, signaling your body it naturally, naturally to produce it i would think, I think they're hard to, to catch yeah. i would imagine but if you start hard. seeing articles where they're like this athlete, that athlete busted, busted. Then, the, then the of course you know because that that will be part of the whole machine, right? The whole machine. Sure. What they'll do is they'll first create their narrative to kind of get this public opinion, 
and the public's gonna be like, those cheaters or whatever. <sighs> and then the politicians will come in and be like, we'll save you. We're going to regulate the shit. <laughs> then you see, <laughs> yeah. you kind of saw signs of this with SARMs, right? With like uh, CrossFit athletes getting popped with uh, SARMs and whatnot. But I haven't seen anything with yeah. peptides. SARMs are totally different. Yeah, totally SARMs different. SARMs are drugs. Yeah. And uh, they're not naturally occurring. They're artificial, yeah. In the body. And yeah, I would not I would not mess with uh, SARMs at all. But yeah. So that's what I, I would predict. If that happened, and then if like somebody got hurt from using them, and then that got, you know, blown up, like... I remember when uh, testosterone and anabolic steroids really became um, scheduled heavily or, or controlled heavily was, uh, remember Lyle Alzado? Yes. Yep. There was a huge campaign with that to put fear over steroids. He had uh, brain tumors, yeah. which by the way, steroids don't cause brain tumors at all. There's no, it doesn't do anything to the brain like that. But he got brain tumors. He comes out and he's like, I took steroids. I think this is why. The media ran with it. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Johnson in the 19, I don't remember which Olympics, 84 maybe. He was a sprinter against for Carl Canada. Lewis. Yeah. Uh, no, Carl Lewis, I don't think I ever Didn't got Didn't he run against him? No, no. Oh, he, he got ran second against to him. him. Yeah. Yes. Dude, and then later, I think I think he got busted he for way later on. Yeah, but Ben Johnson was Winstraw, and that, that became okay. a popular. Dude, I got some for Since you're bringing up sports in 1984, I had a 1985 sport thing for you that I thought that you would actually even appreciate. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Today's giveaway is the time crunch bundle, which is also the sale that we have going on this month. So one of you will get it for free. Here's what's in that bundle. Maps 15 maps, anywhere maps, prime and the eat to perform ebook. All of that. One of you will win for free. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If we pick you as the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section. Everybody else, all those things I just said in this bundle, you can get all of it for one low price, $99.99. That'll save you over 200 bucks. Huge promotion. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. They did this thing, okay, for the, I thought this was absolutely brilliant. I did not. So they offered uh, 3,000 free tickets to a Redskins game, 1985 to this. And they did it to uh, people that had warrants out for their arrest. So the, wait a minute. the FBI. That sounds like a term. <laughs> oh, so the, wait, the no. FBI had a list of all of these these people that had outstanding warrants. This is 1985. They did wait this. a minute. They, is this they, how they, they trapped them? They, yeah, they, they mailed them a chance to have a free ticket to like the Redskins game. You idiots. And they all showed up, dude. You morons. They had like, I, I forget what the record number of arrests that happened. They showed like, up. Oh, yeah. Wagons on free the, tickets. You thanks know for saying? coming. Yeah. Uh, well, what a brilliant, what a brilliant if, sting. Huh? Imagine how many they catch if it was Raiders. Whoa. Oh, <laughs> stupid. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Stupid. I know the reputation. <laughs> the black I'm, hole. Yeah. The only Are game. Are you looking it up right now, Doug? Yeah, so they caught, uh, they did 144 arrests. <laughs> it cost $22,000 to run the sting operation and yeah. they arrested 144 That's people. That's hilarious. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey guys who broke the law, come over here. We'll give you free stuff. I know. Wow. wow. wow it's it's pretty so... clever, right? Did you ever hear? Okay. So you know how some- going to pass up free tickets. You know how some countries <laughs> do these uh, gun buyback programs. Have you heard of this? So in order to like reduce guns or whatever, they'll say, um, we won't ask any questions. Yeah. You bring us your gun and we'll give you X amount of dollars for it. Yes. Well, some smart people- uh, at home made like made their own guns right yeah, rudimentary guns with like a pipe and wood <laughs> you know? they, they had to buy it off them. yeah and they had and they brought yes. like 15 of them. i heard about this and yeah. like they like 3d printed a few versions yeah, of them dude. and just like brought them to get sold and what a like, brilliant hustle they don't have to demonstrate that it works they should look at dude, right? well speaking of yeah. 3d printing do you see the newest hustle with the chat gpt and kids now what so the kids are using in school 3D printers to use the writing, writing and Chat GPT to prompt, prompting Chat GPT to write their essays, and then they handwrite them with the. So it matches their handwriting. <laughs> Shut up. The 3D, up. Pr yes, dude. Hey, Kids now a using hack for Chat GPT and 3D printers. Look it up. Doug. Hey, you know what? Maybe what dude. we're doing is we're just training a bunch of future entrepreneurs. Yeah. <laughs> Because yeah. that's basically what entrepreneurs. I mean, I mean you, you all I was doing was trying to scheme the system. Listen, if a kid, the whole time if, I'm if, in school, if a kid has figured out how to use a 3D printer like that to to mimic their handwriting, and in addition to that, prompt ChatGPT to give yeah. you a good essay, the kid probably deserves a goddamn yeah. A. Exactly. Look, he's like he's a, he's a future CEO. Of 3D, some, like, tech 3D printer does homework. Yeah. What? <laughs> wow. 
It's an efficiency, right? Isn't right. that the goal? I mean, always. It, would you, okay, How conflicted okay, would you be? If I, was yeah, I was just gonna say. Imagine you walk in on your wow, son right dude. now, okay? And he's writing his yeah, one of his big. Yeah, you'd be mad at him for this. Yeah, his big senior paper like this, and he's chilling, right? He's like this. He's in his room. He's playing modern warfare, <laughs> right? And over in the corner is the 3D printer writing his essay. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Do you, are you mad? Part of me is, I'm going to say, I mean, the conversation I would have is- I just shake my head and be like, ah. Oh. Yeah, I, it would be about, I'd have the conversation about honesty because that's a real conversation. But then the other part of me would be like, look, uh, this skill that you have, mm -hmm. we can <laughs> yeah. go far yeah, away. Let's if use we, it for good. This correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We just have to we use We have to it. harness this. Uh, we have to use this for good. You know yeah. what I mean? He's like, well, I'm actually selling these essays to other kids. Like, mm. That's pretty simple. But I mean, it wasn't <laughs> half, half the time you're <laughs> in like, school. He's like, no, dad, I write my essays. Yeah. yeah. These are all the kids. Yeah. That, boy, then I'd be yeah. <laughs> Like, He's uh, like, I don't feel comfortable, Dad, turning in something that's not my oh, work, yeah. and so I actually write my essays. Yeah. But I've got fifteen that are being printed yeah. out for other people. Like, oh, yeah. the, there's a distinctive <laughs> things I remember about that, right? Like having to write. So you, you, they they didn't want you to type it up because people would. I mean, they were getting caught like plagiarizing all the time. So we we actually had to like handwrite. And so I figured out that like I start the first paragraph like super legible and everything's really good, and the rest of it is just dog shit. And I just yeah. like. And then they wouldn't read the whole thing because the teachers what? were lazy. Oh, what? And that I knew works. this. Yes. <laughs> I've never minute. heard of that word. Wait a minute. You would literally just scribble? Yeah, we just like <laughs> scribble like half of it. I swear to God. And Bro, like what half a dead giveaway is your teacher lazy as shit. Wow. That's crazy. Yes. Either lazy or what if they felt bad for Justin? Or they just were like, oh, he's a good student. And then like, <laughs> would just like what if they slough read it, off like, like, oh, Well, at least he did the first half. <laughs> <time. laughs> Poor Justin. Bro, I was always the, trying to like psychologically get in there. This poor kid. This poor kid. Kid. Remember he tackled the tree the other day four times? <laughs> it's yeah. Stupid. No, I would psychoanalyze every one of my teachers, like how they would like how they would like construct these questions because then you'd see them on the test and be like, this is what they're actually trying to get to. Yep. And then you'd find the answer easy wow. without even barely like putting thought into Dude, it. Dude, wow. I had I had a teacher that literally I'll never I mean should I say his name? I'm not gonna say his name. Even though I want to call him out. It's Dave. <laughs> Loser. <Yeah. laughs> he would literally uh, sit at the front of class, sit, okay, in his desk, and he'd have us take out our textbook, and then we would read the textbook oh, out yeah. loud, oh, yeah. and that was it. No, yeah. we had, I had teachers. He did nothing else. Yeah, no, I had teachers. I had an English Sal, teacher. Uh, Sal, page five, first paragraph, and then we'd go through the, and yeah. literally he would just sit there, Bro. and he'd read, and he'd do his own shit, and we'd just read the fucking textbook. I read, yeah, I would read Shakespeare like that, and, and, and just take on these roles, just because I get so bored, and I'd give it like a, a oh, lisp, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've ever told this, yeah, I would like read a Mercutio, you yeah, know, yeah. it'd be all like, you know, Femi. That is hilarious, yeah. dude. because oh. it was, you know, it's so boring. I, mean, I don't know if so that's lazy. worse. Or I, so I had a, a biology teacher that used to just roll out the TV. So just roll it. <laughs> as soon as you get to class, I mean, it was like one of your favorite classes because you turn the lights out. No, you mess around. Out. Yeah, yeah. Like you roll out the TV and you'd watch some some video on whatever we were learning. So I had, wow. so <clears throat> I, what I used to do with teachers like that, because it used to infuriate me because I get bored easily, but I also love to learn. So I'm like, if I had a good teacher or if I was engaged, man, I was the best, right? But the teachers that bored me used to piss me off. And I would, uh, I would poke at them on purpose. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had this one teacher that at least, God, at least that whole school year happened at least five times, so a lot, where I wasn't paying attention, right? You know, and I didn't, I, did, I had no respect for them. And they'd call me out to try and catch me. So Sal, what, uh, what, blah, blah, blah. And I'd have the answer. And they'd be like, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. it looks like your class is super easy. I don't have to pay attention. I would say some shit like that. <laughs> and they would always try to catch me, but I'd have the answer because it was a topic that I, you know, read about on my own. Right. How annoying. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of annoying, I just, I had literally the week of hell last week. Everybody's sick. The week of hell. Hell. So you, here's the thing. You came back and then you went home and then you got all Dude, pukey bro. like after that. So there was this like window of like you were kind of normal. No, it started out that I, my daughter and I got this like cold with a fever. Okay. So first we got this cold with the fever. So I'm like, damn, that's when I, I couldn't, I didn't come into work or whatever. Then I was feeling a little better and I came to work and then uh, Aurelius you know, I get a message, Aurelius is throwing up. I'm like, oh, here we go. Yep. Cause I don't know if you guys know this or not, but the a norovirus is like spreading like wildfire right now, which is, it's a really nasty stomach bug. So he starts puking. We do our podcast half, halfway through the podcast. I'm like, oh man, I feel, I don't feel so good. Mm -hmm. I go home. 
Jessica's thrown up. I'm thrown up. Aurelius is thrown up. We got to take care of all the kids and we're totally sick. If you're a parent and you have, especially little kids, and you're sick as hell uh, and they're yeah. sick as hell all at the same time, nightmare. Such a nightmare, yeah. dude. To get the strength to go like, you know, my son wakes up in the middle of the night because he puked himself. Uh, and I myself am like trying to hold it back. And I got to go in there and like oh poor kids God. crying. And I got to yeah. like throw him in the tub and like, what do we do with Pass all this the stuff? Bucket. Yeah. Throw it away and throw away his sheets. I'm not even going to wash them. Oh, <laughs> what a total, total man thing to do right there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just throw it away. This is yeah, my new one. Easy to start over. <laughs> Bro, it was so, and I felt so bad. We're not built, we're not built to handle that stuff. No, dude. I mean, seriously, like give me a, that's why when Jessica give got me a sick, 16 I'm, hour work week and the blistering sun and like killing my back to do, yeah. I got that. Yeah. Let me get a, a nasty cold and my, and the wife and the kid be down. Like, oh God. Yeah. You're send help kid. send help oh that's why when she got sick i was like oh no yeah. <laughs> what am i gonna do yeah. just got sick too yeah and then we're poor, all doomed poor aurelius he's so cute right he's you like throw up or whatever and oh he's all sad and then he goes up to his mom and he goes mama i'm sorry i throw up oh and i'm just like oh, oh when max poor, does that it breaks my heart poor guy uh, he felt bad dude yeah, for getting yeah. sick yeah. like it's not your Barbara. fault buddy yeah. It's not your fault. Oh, it's so sad. And then it was funny because then we would, because then he started getting sympathy, right? Like, how you doing, buddy? You know, and, you know, let him, he never watches TV, right? We let him watch TV all day because he was just lethargic and, you know, poor kid, right? So then we're calling family members. And every time somebody would get on the phone, he, they'd say, hey, buddy, how you doing? And he'd look down and go, I sick. And he'd just make this little sad <laughs> face. And all of us would be like, this poor guy. <laughs> Luckily, the, the baby, the youngest, uh, didn't get it. Um, which I was worried about because she's only three months. And um, so Jessica got sick first, which then that was a blessing because, you know, if you breastfeed, you'll pass your antibodies on to your infant. So she got sick first. So I said, okay, cool. So long as Dahlia doesn't get it like right now, she'll be able to not get it because you'll give her. And sure enough, she didn't get sick. So oh, like, good, thank good thing. Yeah. God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, snowed in anyway, dude. How weird is that? That's crazy. Like, we don't, we haven't had snow here. I don't know, like decades. So you There's couldn't no drive over seventeen because no. it was snowed out. Yeah, the whole thing was snowed, and they had to like. Well, they have no. I mean, there's we have, no equipment. Yeah, as I say, though, Katrina was asking. <laughs> it like, never snowed. I know. Yeah. Katrina was like, "Oh my God, did it snow that bad?" I was like, it doesn't have to snow much. I was like, "It's not like they're prepared." Yeah, this isn't like going over. There's the, no over roads. You know? yeah. Like, so that's the thing too. I, I guess I heard like so there was some people in. Um, Boulder Creek close by that where I was at four by four trucks. Everything was like, you know, like it wasn't like they had some like front wheel drive vehicles they're sliding around in, but literally had no traction because the roads aren't really set up for that. And like, like slid completely off and like went into ditches. And this was happening like all over the place. Cars were just, whoosh, just flying off the road. Oh my God. And so I was crazy. like, so there was this whole message out, like, don't leave the house. Like if you don't have to, and blah, yeah. blah, blah. I'm like, really? It's that bad. Well, that roads, the road's not designed for that. They don't have the, they don't have the Caltrans set up over there to clear the roads over there like that. So it's just like, yeah. Not, you know, that 17 has got, snow. has gotten voted, uh, one of the most has, dangerous roads of, yeah. in, all, in the whole country. Well, well especially, it has dead man's curve, right? Dude, like back in the day, I think this is the craziest thing ever. They didn't even have that center divide. No, no. And, no. And, and so when my so oh, when my yeah. parents grew up over it's here, insane. like that was the place you raced too. Dead man, yeah. you would. That was how it got its nickname. Was like kids like racing seventeen back before the divider was there. It had to be the most dangerous road places. ever. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, you know like, what I used to do? Oh, I, I used to race on. So, yeah, no, uh, and is, isn't it? Isn't it? I, I heard it. I don't know if this is true, Justin, but you know because you you grew up in Santa Cruz. Because Santa Cruz seventeen is what connects Santa Cruz in that area to San Jose and yeah. So, is it true that that people in Santa Cruz have fought hard to prevent them from building any other ways? To come over the hill um, because I, they don't want it to get super busy. I packed. think there's been lobbying for that. Yeah, I mean they've they've done quite a bit of that, and, and two, just with um, a lot of the commercial kind of uh, stores and things, like because there's lots of local like small business and stuff like they've really tried to kind of keep that intact. And so yeah, I'm sure there's been lobbying for that, but there used to be old uh, Santa Cruz Highway was the first one before they built like 17. But yeah, there was plans at one point of like making it multiple lanes and like having like a nice easy way to get across. But like, yeah, the traffic's already is bad during the summer to get over. And so I think, 
Yeah, people people live there. Yeah, because you can't no. you can't build out there anymore, right? Hasn't hasn't like most of that area been all blocked off and and turned into like national park area and stuff like all the trees back I mean, by you? They, they could if they wanted to. I think what Justin's saying because yeah. that's what I heard. Not about. if it's already been. Not if it's been labeled a national park. That's well. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, may, maybe they they Do you know Justin. They've zoned it that. I way. I mean, there's yeah. So there's like certain areas of what you're saying on yeah on that um, a mountain. I think yeah, are designated. like if you have an area that's are you could rebuild in an area, but new areas. I don't think you could even build out there anymore. Because imagine they, if they imagine if they made getting over the hill like, easier. way easier how packed it would get because it's a beautiful area yeah it's great place it's cheaper it's it's less than san jose because it's so hard to get to because 17 can be a pain in the ass yeah so if they opened it all up it would just become busy and packed like uh well like yeah, I wonder if that's true yeah i wonder because even like scott's valley's gotten a lot more uh pop populated because it's not that far to get over and so yeah. it's like the first step in, and maybe in, because of virtual work yeah the virtual works up open that up quite a bit oh man so. it's crazy what i do because i mean you're on your you first hit los gatos like los gatos is the in my opinion the closest santa cruz like vibe to San Jose, mm -hmm. and it's ungodly price. It's like, so it's, expensive. It's it's so, like the, one of the most expensive it places. Is, it's, like, it's insane. Beverly Dude. Hills of San Jose. Yeah. It really is. Oh, no, I mean, yeah. You get uh, a, like a three-bedroom, 1,500-square-foot house in, in Los Gatos would be like, what, $3 million? Oh, yeah, at least. At least. Yeah, at least that. <laughs> at least yeah. that. No, it's crazy. I own, that's where my business used to be, I remember, and uh, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, and then no, there's the, yeah. night, the areas of Los Gatos are a little more expensive. It's ridiculous. You can't even touch them. I saw, I went by your old place and it's still got the, the abs. Sign is, still there. is it still going? No, I don't think so. I think they just, I think it was just abandoned. Oh, so, really? Mm -hmm. So nobody's even leasing that space. It's, I don't know. I, every time I go by. Oh, you don't, I mean, you used to love going to that breakfast spot. I thought for sure you'd go over there still. You don't go yeah, over there? Yeah, so I've gone over there a few times. My parents go there all the time and uh, they always look in the window and stuff. There's nothing in there. Hmm. So uh, I don't, I don't know. It's kind of wild that your logo is still there. I know it I mean, is. I know. Interesting. I know. Yeah. I know been there Memories. For, yeah. been, been there for a long, old time. It's a good time. You know, hey, talking but, about the the national park thing and, and the all and zoning and do you um let me look this up for me. I was watching the <laughs> torturing Katrina. I watched the the nature stuff. You know, she gets so <laughs> she, gets, she goes, "Are you punishing me?" And I'm like, "It's relaxing for me to watch it." I was watching one of the newer ones on Netflix, the one that Obama narrated. And it was doing like all the national parks. Did you know that like that wasn't even a thing? Like, not. And I like bringing this up because I know we talk such. Didn't Teddy Roosevelt, Roosevelt start that? Yeah, yeah. And I believe it was. And look up which the first national park and what year it was. was. It Yosemite. Uh, no, not Yosemite. Or I think it was actually Yellowstone. 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 Yeah. I think Yellowstone was the first one. But what I found fascinating about this, and this is why I wanted to bring it up, is because we always share negative stuff, and it's always like, oh, how bad we are to the earth, and also like that. First of all, these national parks didn't exist just 60 plus years ago. Mm -hmm, I think yeah. it's around that time, give, give or take. So it didn't even exist. And now there's like tens of thousands tons. across the, like it, it, it caught like wildfires as a, as a, a trend of protecting all these areas. Yeah, you have national parks, you have state parks, you have county parks. And they're, there. and they're, you know, you're seeing a lot of these, you know, uh, species that were going to go extinct that bison. are re repop. Yeah. Bison is one of them. Bison like you them. see all these that are, I mean, the condor, like there's a lot of these animals that were going to go extinct that because we've have saved these made them national parks and they're starting to repopulate and grow. There's like, they've made a lot of good trash and then the amount of, of carbon too. Like the, it's been incredible what we've done. And I didn't know that. I thought they had been around forever. I just assumed that. No, I think we it never was highlight the positive. I, I think things. it was Roosevelt yeah. that started. Was it? No, it wasn't actually it was under, uh, let's see, president Grant. Oh, so before so this oh. was in 1872. Who was, was the was first it? one? It was Yellowstone. Oh, so 2.2 Yellowstone. million acres. Okay. Yeah. How then, many total do we have now? Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, let me find. Yeah. Find out to, yeah. total national. Have you guys parks. been to Yellowstone? Uh, no, yeah. When I was little. Oh, it's so Yosemite is one of the most beautiful in terms of like picturesque. Right. But Yellowstone is so spectacular. There's parts of Yellowstone where you feel like you're on another planet. Better for wildlife. When too. you see, oh, well, you see like it's it's huge. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went, you know, when I went with with Jessica a few years ago and. You see, like there are just these these pools of of water with gases coming out and the crazy looking colors in the water. And you're like, what? This doesn't even look like yeah. Earth. It's 
the super volcano waiting yeah. to happen. Oh, yeah. it is a super volcano. <laughs> you know what? Watching <laughs> this, kill the whole where world. I really want to go is to Patagonia. That's what looks really sick, dude. The the amount of like how large that that's I think that's one of the largest in where national. Is that? uh, it's over in Chile. Oh, it's like okay. the whole it's like the whole coastline. It's massive. I'm embarrassed because I thought yeah. that was just a brand of clothing. I swear to God. <laughs> you yeah. said is it. Is that and I'm Chile like, or is that Argentina? Patagonia. Look it up. I think I think it's Chile. I don't know. Mm. I'm probably the worst when it comes to geography, but I was, I'm pretty sure that's where it's at. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like in our backyard. No idea. No. <laughs> you didn't know that that, that Patagonia was well, at Madagascar. No, I thought I swear I had no idea. Oh, both countries. Argentina. That's how and Chile. that's how huge it is, right? Yeah. It runs wow. the whole. It's like that's why I think it's the largest. I think it's now grown to be like one of the largest collection of national parks that they've really. Yeah, and and just the amount of wildlife and stuff that is there is unbelievable. Wow, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Hey, did you guys see in uh, Bro Bible that they did this thing on on TikTok and asked like all these fitness dudes <laughs> what the their favorite workout shirt or to uh -uh. wear was? Uh -uh. Viori. One, oh wow! First place, really? the Strato. Bro, that's a big plug from Bro Bible. The yeah. Strato Tech T. That we, we, like we, like gym bros. They they all said it was the most comfortable, best shirt. Wow, dude, Viori just crushing, killing it. Yeah, killing it. Wow, it's crazy. If if you if I'm Lululemon, and I see them coming up, I'm like, all right, guys, we gotta. I, I mean, I, I guarantee now they're having meetings and trying to figure out what the hell to do because Viori's just exploding. Yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, look at that bro Bible. Wow. Yeah, yeah. so the men of TikTok say that this Viore t-shirt is the softest shirt you'll ever wear. It is. I that's mean, that's, that's thing. my favorite you shirt. You put it on and it, that's it a straight up for article too. That's not an ad. No, no, yeah, it's it was, a legit yeah. it's a legit article. Wow. All right. What a great plug for them. Speaking of things that are not legit, uh <laughs> I'm going to try and, I'm going to try and keep this from turning into angry uh, rant rant time. But I don't know if you guys see the Wall Street Journal article that came out on uh, oh my COVID-19. God. Yes, let's talk about this. Did you see about this? Yes, I have. Seen so this. I think it was the FBI. I've, I've seen the change of narrative. That's what I've seen. But oh. Go ahead. Oh, Let me hear it. Let so me hear. CIA, FBI coming out saying, hey, everybody, it's likely that COVID yeah, was- Department of Energy, right? A created, yeah, it was a, it was a, a virus created- in the Wuhan laboratory, and it leaked. Oh, the the one that they censored everybody and said that's conspiracy theory. Yeah. So here's where this is where I want to go with is this. the most likely scenario. I'm gonna go Weird. down. I'm gonna go down the list of stuff that would have got you kicked off social media or lost your job if you were a doctor or a researcher or a teacher or any other public figure. I'm gonna go down the list. Okay. Let's start with this is uh this is a virus. In a pl in coming from a place which is one in the entire region where they do gain of function type research on on uh, and create new viruses, it may be a leak. In fact, some scientists came out and said early yeah. on, "Hey, we analyze this. The odds that this is a natural virus is very low." By the way, those people lost their jobs and got censored. Okay, yeah. so that's one. Here's number two. Hey, you know, uh, wearing masks, it's not going to work with something like this. That would have got you censored. Cochrane review just comes out. Oh, it turns out masks did dick. Yeah, irrelevant. Nothing. Why are, why are people still wearing them? Like, Number three. Well, uh, we're yeah. going to get there. Comfort. It's like a pacifier. We'll get there. Number <laughs> it's, it's like a pa Number three. True. Number three. Lockdowns. Everybody. Oh, lock everybody down. Shut businesses down. Keep everybody home. Do whatever. And the policies leading up to uh, right before this last pandemic, they never would have enacted stuff like this. In fact, that was never a strategy. All of a sudden- we're locking everybody down. Of course, they start by saying two weeks to flatten the curve turned into two years. That, the the studies are now coming out showing the lockdowns did dick, yeah. did nothing. Well, number four. Destroyed small business. These vaccines, 90% effective. If you don't get it, you're going to be spreading the virus, whatever. Guess what? You get the vaccine, you still spread the fucking virus, okay? So this is all of it. All of it was complete bullshit. Yeah. And what it is, and this is On the truth now. I'm gonna every make, single I'm, level. I'm going to make a statement right now that I've avoided saying since the beginning of this, but I've I totally believed. This was this was the largest organized, organized by the entire Western world, PSYOP ever conducted on people. Mm -hmm. Everybody got PSYOPed so hard. And the ramifications <clears throat> that, that came from that are distrust in the medical community, the scientific community. And we killed more people than we saved because now we know, which a lot of smart people were saying, we're going to destroy the fabric of society. You're going to cause other unintended consequences. What are those? Obesity went up. 
Cancer deaths went up because people stopped going to the doctor. Suicide went up. Suicide went up. Drug abuse went up. Oh, we're going to force little kids to wear masks because we're, you know, whatever. Even though early on we knew that kids had no, that played no role, had no risk, whatever. Yeah. So you had developmental issues because children need to read faces and lips and see people. And now they're isolated. So childhood depression, suicide rates among kids went through the roof. We literally, literally what we did was we had a cut on our hand and we said we should cut our arm off and mm -hmm. that's going to save everybody. Yep. We hurt ourselves so bad and- I'm definitely upset at the propaganda that came from all angles, mm -hmm. but I'm more upset at the cowards that I'm talking about the regular people who not on themselves, who decided it was good to impose this on the other people, yeah. tyrannize who, other people. Who lashed out on everybody else. Destroy people's business. People lost their jobs and businesses and children lost education and terrible. Yeah. And all the evidence now is there. It's totally clear. So what I'd like to see now is moving forward I'd like to see people next time this happens, because it's going to happen in a different form, next time people do give the middle finger and say, no, uh, I'm going to preserve my liberty and you can suck it. I'm not going to do any of your crazy shit anymore. That's what I'd like to see. You think that'll happen? I don't. No. Unfortunately. <laughs> no, that's the thing. <laughs> History says no. I mean, unfortunately, this just makes me more angry. Like it's, it's tough to, um, it, it's, it's tough you know, place to be in because it's like, you know, a lot of things that I was alarmed by and was like, this is a red flag for me. And, you know, I'm going to see how this, pl it played out exactly how I, like I thought it would. Yeah. And, 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 and that's the most frustrating part. Yeah. And, and, I, and, you know, this is connected to so many other things. Like first off, people want to get rid of, uh, while this was happening, by the way, there was a large segment of our population that, that a majority of, I'm not going to say which political side, but you can guess. When they would do polls, a majority of them agreed that people should be locked in their houses. These were polls that were done. They should be locked in their houses. People should lose their jobs. 30% of the same, the same side said that people's kids should be taken from them mm -hmm. if they refuse to vaccinate them or they refuse to wear masks and do that kind of stuff. Those are the, that, it's, that stuff is so alarming. And this is why Americans won't give up their guns, bottom line, because they know when shit hits the fan, that uh, the only person who's got my own back is going to be me and, and, and why our state system is always going to exist. Because if we didn't have our state system, the federal government would have imposed all kinds of crazy stuff on us like they did in Australia, like they did in New Zealand, like they did in Italy and France and in the UK and other countries. That saved our asses was our Supreme Court system and our state system. Because a lot of states were like, no, we're not doing that. We don't live yeah. in one of those. Unfortunately, we're in California. But other states did stop. That this is why I get so fascinated by cults. I mean, it's like a little microcosm of of the bigger society at whole. Like the same percentages of people that just completely conform, even though that they know there's questionable activity at the top, um, don't question it. They just f fall lockstep in line. And it's it's to me, it's just it's interesting. I just want to look at like what that is in, in human behavior and like the the trends and the tendencies there. So that way. Yeah, we can sort of like get ahead of a lot of these things. Oh, I think the crazy part that is, you know, I did a I did a poll a while back, and and there was there was a good percentage of people that, you know, regretted doing the vaccine and stuff like that. But there's still a much larger percentage that the the damage is done. They've already been manipulated. That. And now, like, we're even making jokes about it. You saw Woody Harrelson came out on uh, Saturday Night Live and did, like, a little a little skit. Right. And I and I think that the the narrative now is like, we, oh, you know, we did the best we could with the information that we had. And at that time, Bullshit. that's what it was. Bullshit. And, you know, now we know better. And, oh, stupid us. And let, let's laugh it off. And to me, that is what's happening. Because, again, I still have Suppressed haven't, counterpoints. I, I haven't seen any of my friends that were uh, you know aggressively pushing this agenda also come out and admit they were wrong even I, I, they don't think they were wrong they again think they're doubling down on you know well at the time it was the best it seemed like the right move it right? was the yeah. we thought was the right move and looking back of course but we would have never we didn't know that we didn't know and Look, so this was the, this was us being safe I'm the not, safest we thought we could I'm be I'm not mad and, at people for 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 doing stuff for themselves I, I get it man this was such a coordinated psyop attack mm -hmm. from all angles, media, science, 
Your work was would tell you you're going to be fired. Your neighbors. And, and, and not only that, you had all Western nations were doing this unified together. So I don't, I'm not mad at people who were doing it for themselves. I'm mad at the people who said, I'm doing it for me, but you'd have to be forced to. Yeah. You should lose your job if you don't do what I... So what we need to do moving forward is if shit happens, we need to stay in lines with liberty. And what does that say? If shit happens, it's your responsibility. If you don't want to go meet with other people, that that's your choice. If you don't want to open your business, that's your choice. If you want to put a sign on your business that says you can't come in here unless you wear a mask or unless you're vaccinated, that's your choice. But that business over there, that guy wants to sell donuts and on his sign it says, anybody welcome, it's his business. And the people who go in, that's their choice. Yeah. That's what that's that's what's in line with liberty. And history shows us that the people that impose the crazy controls and tyranny are never right. It's never, yeah. never. Tell me a time when it was a great idea. By the way, when China was locking people down, locking people in their apartments, literally, uh, they would uh, me they would weld, weld their locks it. shut, the doors, yeah, and their doors shut. That's crazy. You had politicians from America and scientists from America coming over here saying it's working, guys over there. What they're doing is totally working. <laughs> it's just pure propaganda. It yeah. ain't working. China's got they're no. full of COVID too. No. Oh, absolute. No, there was insanity. Plenty of counterpoints and plenty of people out there kind of voicing uh, their warnings and, and alarms. Uh, and trying to get uh, you know them to reconsider these policies and methods, and but it got completely snuffed and suppressed, and um, literally labeled as conspiracy theorists, or they, they demonized and villainized anybody that had any opposing point, which is never good, never, never good. Like you have to you have dialogue. You have to have you have to have pushback because you have to be able to overcome those um, you know that pushback with reasonable answers. And if you can't provide a reasonable, logical answer uh, to these counterpoints, then it's bullshit propaganda. Yeah, and the, and the damage is going to be so long lasting. I mean, you know, you know, people. It's so sad. There were people that died alone in hospitals because they were no no one was allowed to visit them. Funerals were not allowed to be held. Yep. You know, you lose a loved one. We can't go, we can't go, like our so, our society is built, we're humans, we're so social, right? Do you know how destructive that is to force people to not be around each other when somebody dies or a baby's born yeah. or your kid is sick and you can't go in the Weddings, hospital? funerals, so, like it's just crazy. I mean, it was, it's collective insanity. And like I said, uh, I don't know. I hope this lasts at least a few generations where people look back and go, yeah. unfortunately, what's going to, my, my fear is all this did was create so much distrust in everything that now nobody trusts anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I, don't, the, I don't think anybody learned from it. And I think that yep. if, if they were brilliant enough to do a psyop like this, they'll just, they'll find another way to do it and it'll, it'll look different the next time. And, and because it'll look enough different, that people will all fall into the same bullshit trap. And it's, I mean, at the end of the day, the truth, most people are sheep. Yeah. Most people want to be led, want to be told. Not Most people don't want to push back or stand up for themselves. It's it's a fact. We know that. Yeah. So, you know, to me, some, that's why like, I'm, I'm so over it. I'm so over even talking about it. Like, it's like it, it, the, the stuff that you're talking about right now, like, is any of this a shock or surprise? I mean, just because they're coming out in the news. So to me, like really all you're seeing right now, they've known all that shit for a long time. They're just now dripping it to us mm -hmm. a little bit at a time. So then we could, you know, laugh it off and say things like, oh, you know, well, we did the best we could when that, you know, and that's just all part of it. And then we'll look back in five years and be like, oh man, remember that time we made that little mistake where we did and people will yeah. fall for the next one. It's just well, one of come the big, on. if you didn't okay. see if you didn't see that, you probably won't see the next one. No, I'll, I'll, okay. Now to speak logically, you have to always, whenever you're enacting a policy, you have to consider the unintended consequences and you can't look at something one sided. What we did is we took infectious disease experts. And if you weren't an infectious disease ex expert, nobody wanted to hear what you had to say. Oh, no, you're not qualified. So we had a bunch of infectious disease <laughs> Dr. Malone. experts come out and tell us what our policy should be. And they didn't talk to anybody who understands economics. They didn't talk to psychologists, social scientists. They didn't talk to parents. They didn't talk to anybody else who would have said, wait a minute, this infectious disease expert says we should force three-year-olds to wear masks in preschool but that's going to damage their learning ability 
their brain development, their social skills. What about the depression? So nobody considered anything else. It was all about, well, if we can reduce it by one case, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, and which it didn't, by the way. Like now the data's coming out and they're like, it didn't do anything. It's what a terrible. Do you do you think don't you think that's like the root difference between someone who would label themselves conservative versus progressive? Mm -hmm. Someone who's progressive is always gonna push for taking chances and doing things without for sure thinking about the unintended consequences. Someone who's on the conservative side is going to be conservative on it. Like, yeah, maybe that's a good idea, but let's test more. Let's be more. Isn't that like the root difference between <clears throat> two different people or ideologies of like how you believe all things should be done? Isn't, you need, isn't that where it comes you, from? You need both and both can become toxic. You need one to push uh, change innovation and to reevaluate what's always being done, which is important. But then you need the other side to say, hold on a second. This has been done a particular way for so long because of these particular values. So you do need that that balance. Um, but I don't know. To me, it's I just, mean, that's what I – when I when I yeah. think back to what we saw unfold is like – and just in this case, the progressive people won the battle of getting their agenda pushed. And looking back now, now it looks like all the conservative people were correct. Yeah. You know? But what if it was the other way around? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean – like I said, you need a balance. I think who always wins is the one that can scare everybody the most. And conservatives have done this in the past too when they were the warmongers, yeah. which they've been in the past, when they're the ones that say, you know, hey. It's so ironic how that flipped. Well, because it's whoever's in power becomes the warmongering uh, party. Yeah. Um. So that's why the whole like two sides thing sometimes is like, really? Not really. Yeah, it's the not, same coin. It's not. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Head or tails, it's still the quarter. It's just moving in whatever direction they want. And yeah. That's so, so obvious. Now. On a lighter note for Doug, I have- Sorry, uh, everybody. I, knew, I, have I was some, trying not to rant, Doug. I have that? some uh, dad trivia again for okay. you guys. Let's yeah, do so it. Andrew, you can play. Okay. <laughs> so this is uh, first person to get this. Where is the Lion King- the base out of like the uh, the Pride Lands? Where is that? Where is that the at? The Serengeti? Oh. In Africa. Yeah, because it is... Andrew, I thought maybe here. Yeah, because it's not the Sahara Desert. Oh. Uh, I, mean, yeah. I don't know what... Uh, I have no I mean, idea. Is it guess. like in... Kenya. I, Kenya, yeah. Oh, oh. Kenya. Yeah, oh, wait, yeah. the song. Okay, yeah. No, that's not that's, what he said. Kenya. I don't know what he says. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what he says. You know, oh. The reason why that came up was I was watching that... I was watching that... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Docu you know, that documentary or whatever that the uh, narrated by Barack Obama or whatever, and um, they were in Kenya. I can't even remember what what he was sh what national park he was sharing there. And I looked and I was like, and we had just I had just been taking my son through the Lion Kings, and so we've been uh -huh. watching Lion King like crazy. And I took a chance, like, man, that sure looks like you know the the Lion King scene. You know, I'm like yeah. literally, they, it looks like they actually what you see in the cartoon. They took that that out of there. Yeah, they took that. It's that's a that's really how it's laid out. Like very very similar, right? And I'm like, man, that looks that looks. Is that really one of the cool. highest grossing films? It's got to be right. Yeah. Uh, it's up there. Yeah. It's not the. Remember, I brought to you guys. Oh the, yeah, you did. The, the, the top the top that's producers because right. they well they count multiple right. In Lion King, there's there's two Lion Kings. Is no. that right? I think there's just the one. Well, there's and the live the, action. Uh, one. Yeah, the remake. Oh, I thought they did a, yeah. a, a follow up on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So I mean, the, they, the, the play the Lion King play is exceptional. Have you guys seen it I've before? I've seen it, yeah. Unbelievably creative. Things. Oh, it's so good. Do you have any more trivia or is that it? No, that's it. Oh, just I'll one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and bring one, one dad trivia every time I, that I can. So that one popped oh, in. That's I thought good. that was brilliant. Hey, what was that article uh, in Men's Health? They were talking about, um, I guess, how athletes are using red light therapy like crazy now? Yeah, uh, so Men's Health did a feature on, uh, let's see here, the recovery revolution comes home. And Juve was featured in that. In men's wow, on men's, men's health. health, their yeah. actual brand. Yeah, their oh, actual wow. brand. Yeah. Look at that. Look well, at we our, know. Look at our look at our partners know, getting some love from big, big publications. Now, didn't you guys say that the 49ers use yeah, oh, red yeah. light therapy quite a yeah, bit? Yeah, they were recovery? the first. I think they're in way more NFL teams now. The Niners were the so, first to adopt. So it. here's what's cool about red light therapy. In the past, <clears> recovery <throat> meant just simply tamping down inflammation. The problem with that is when you tamp down inflammation. You also inadvertently tamp down the muscle building signal, right? So it's like if you take anti-inflammatories or do an ice bath after a workout, you are going to reduce inflammation, but part of that is also reducing the muscle building signal. Red light therapy does not do that. Red light therapy 
enhances recovery and also augments the muscle building signal. It also helps with the muscle building part. So it doesn't have that like potential negative effect. So but, speed up recovery, yeah. you still get the adaptation. By signal. the way, that is the science that's being used to be a to uh, do the counter movement on the ice bath right now too. Remember I brought up a, yes. a few oh, weeks yeah. ago about how I see this movement right now within the fitness community and it's it's they're not uh, they're not not intelligent fitness minds like you're talking about some some smart people but that's the science that they're latching on to to talk about how stupid the ice bath oh, is. No. They so, go too far. No, I know. I mean, that's just a, a perfect example, though, of how you're using that to talk about and the benefits of of uh, red light therapy and recovery, mentioning why inflammation has a positive part when it comes to building muscle and the adaptation. Uh, well, this is what uh, ice bath does. It could blunt that. Therefore, we're now saying, okay, it's, mm. it's a terrible use of a tool well, for well, building muscle. Talking about new tools, I want to throw this in real quick. So uh, I'm... I just started a brand new peptide that now I'm experimenting with called MOTS-C, M-O-T-S-C. They call it, and I hate the term, this term because I don't think that's what it is, but they call it exercise in a bottle. <laughs> I swear to God, if you look it up, there were articles written about it called exercise in the bottle because studies on, and on rats showed an improvement in athletic performance by 20 to 40% because what it does is it increases fat oxidation and glucose uptake. Mm. And it does through the mitochondria. It literally tells the mitochondria to just burn more energy. Wow. Now, the side effect being <clears throat> more energy, better performance, and fat loss. So our, you know, our partners at mphormones.com, I, you know, I give them the green light because I'm like, hey, guys, give me everything and I'll <laughs> test it out. <laughs> I'll be your pin cushion. And yeah. they're like, try this. Oh, there it is. The exercise, re the exercise replacement peptide. Oh, it's God. not an exercise replacement. <laughs> That's but uh, yeah. it is interesting. So I took my first dose this morning and it does make you, this is just the first time. So I'm going to keep doing it, let, let you guys know what's happening. But I do, I did feel like my body's warmer, which some people say that's a side effect of the body burning more. No. Um, but I'll let you guys know how it works. See if I get better performance. From now where, okay. So since we know that all, all studies start in like rat models first yeah. to make sure they're safe. And then we move to human models. So I know there's this big knock on any study that's done on a rat. Like, so like, like friends of ours, like Lane, one of his first ways to shit on someone's study is if it's a, a rat study right away. It's like, this wasn't even done in humans. Therefore, uh, we're not going to accept yes. it as like real science yet. Right. So here's the difference is that, um, first off, human studies are always a gold standard, but peptides already exist. So MOTC is in the body anyway. <laughs> it's not a drug. So it's not something that I'm introducing that doesn't exist in my body. MOTC already exists in my body. This is what, remember how Dr. Seeds uh, yeah. explained it to us. They find that people who have higher amounts of this live longer, less body fat, and tend to not get diabetes. There was a study out of uh, Japan that showed that this uh, was connected to longevity as well. So the safety of peptides, because they're already in the body, they already exist, and because the body knows what to do with it, and it's just a signaling system, meaning the body already works with these already. It's already evolved to do so. The potential, you know, the, the, the safety profile, you, you already can assume is going to be much, much higher. Nonetheless, I would still yeah. never do this unless I was supervised by... A doctor. So my my point of bringing the the rat study up to you is is are there examples of you know a a rat study before it makes its way to human studies that is more likely to be um, useful or po positive versus ones that are just like okay that's all the time. I know which ones. Oh, I don't know. That's don't... my point. My point is like okay, so let's for what I mean by that is like okay, we uh, hear about this new drug that does something to the rat's gut and that could have yeah. positive benefits for repopulating your gut with healthy bacteria and it's amazing or whatever like that and it's in a rat versus oh this one actually helps a rat build muscle or this one and are amazing there are, humans yeah so are there ones that translate into human studies more consistently or are there ones that like rarely translate most uh, rat rarely most rarely translate. So when you look at a drug, like a created drug. Hence why like Lane shits on it right Yes. Away. Most of the he's time. he's probably 90% right is what you're yes, saying. Yes. Most of the time, I think a very small percentage then translate to humans. Uh, but again, because peptides already exist in the, in the body, that they find these signaling peptides, 
they know what they do in the body. And then all they do is say, oh, that's, we know what it does. It's already there. So then if we give it, then it's going to do what this thing that it does versus drugs. So that's why peptides are, yeah. are, are not drugs. And, and I'm glad Dr. Seeds explained that to us. It seems to me like um, all of these, uh, like even with the red light and um, you know peptides that are addressing mitochondrial health, like yeah. that seems to be sort of the... Um, one of the biggest movers for like uh, longevity and, and recovery. And oh yeah, because it's it's you know it's part of the cell it's and the it has so many cell. different uh, uh, aspects to it. That's well, the main is, focus. Isn't, of isn't longevity. it like keeping taking care of your engine in your car? Like a car can be a 30, 40 year old car if you keep taking care of the engine, right? If the engine goes to shit, it can look great on the outside, but it ain't gonna. It yeah, gonna if you last look at the long. research on longevity, a good good portion of it is focused on mitochondria, hundred yeah. percent. So. Yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. Do we have a shout out today? Oh, I didn't have one for you. Why don't you give love to our Dr. Seed since we brought him since we brought oh, him what's up? What's his page? I, I think it's Dr. Seed. Is it Dr. Seeds? Anyway, it's great. Uh, one of our I mean, that was a great interview. And we interviewed him and talked about smart dude. Communicates very well, very balanced. Um, so give him a follow if it you're is interested. William William Seeds M D. William Seeds M D. Give yep. him a follow. What's up, everybody? Are you interested in hardcore? performance enhancing supplements. Legion is the best in the business. Real stuff that what the label says is in the bottle. They deliver only science backed ingredients. They have one of the most popular pre-workout supplements on Amazon. They have a great whey protein powder and much more. Go check them out and get a discount. Go to buylegion.com. That's B-Y-L-E-G-I-O-N.com forward slash mind pump. Then use the code Mind Pump and get 20% off your first order. Or if you're a returning customer, you can go to that link, use that code, and get double rewards points. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Hope Is Life 50. What do you personally like to do to re energize your training when you feel in a bit of a rut with your routine? I don't think Sal can answer this. Have you missed a what workout? What does that mean? Have you missed a workout in <laughs> eight years? I don't think you're qualified. Impossible. I don't no, think I do, you're qualified I do, to answer this. I do things all the time to re-energize my, huh? my training. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, it's probably the same thing you guys do. I change my goal. I yeah. change my focus. Mm -hmm. That's got to be the most effective um, way that I found uh, for myself and even for my clients that would kind of get them re-energized. So... You know, one one block, it may be to, um, let's see how much I can train like a bodybuilder and focus on feeling the muscle and getting the pump and sculpting my body. And then, you know, I'm going to train now more like a power lifter or, you know, I'm going to work on the depth of my squat or I'm going to work on my ability to lift something overhead with one arm or work on mobility or something like that. And I'll do it for a block of training. And the reason why it's so energizing is when you do it that way, you, you see progress. And progress is, is fun. It's, it's, it's not fun when you don't see progress. But when you change your workout and you change some of your goals, like if you always train like a bodybuilder and then you decide you're going to train more functional, mm -hmm. for at least three months, you're going to see rapid gains in your functional performance or vice versa, right? You train functional and you train like a bodybuilder. So I, I would say that it has to be one of the easiest like buttons to push when you're feeling kind of like you're in a rut. Yeah, I like to learn a new skill. I like to seek out some kind of new method or, um, and this takes a, a little bit of research, but to, to find a concept or a different exercise that I haven't really adopted and see how that would fit within uh, programming and the way that I uh, construct my workouts. But um I, I go back and forth with a lot of these things, like with the mace bells or like unconventional tools or, you know, kettlebells or, or ways of like, even just using those for, uh, if I'm in like a hypertrophy phase, like where does this even fit? Like where are some of these tools, like, is it possible or is it best suited for, you know, more of my other <clears throat> types of goals for mobility or stability or in that regard. And I like kind of like going through that whole process and to learning something new stimulates what I've already been doing. And, and that just keeps things kind of fresh. Uh, but yeah, that's for the most part is just like, you know, trying to find like some concepts out there because there's so many of them uh, to gain benefit from and see where it can apply to, to other types of workouts. Yeah. I think that's tried and true, right? I think that um, humans are drawn to novelty. So the obvious easy answer I think is to switch up the goal. 
Um, if you've attempted fat loss so many times and you, and you're, you've been, uh, doing that for most of your life, like just changing what you're focused on, I think will be, uh, will help out. Uh, also setting like, uh, like not only different goals, but then like I'll sometimes just kind of like what Justin's alluding to, which is focus on an exercise, learn a new, uh, exercise that takes a lot of skill, like a Turkish get up or even swinging like a mace club, like that that's challenging in itself. And so setting a goal like that, um, also depends on where I'm at. Like if I'm consistent, but I'm in a rut, like let's say I'm training consistently, but I'm just plateaued and I'm, I'm losing motivation and go to the gym. To me, that's the easy transition into like a whole different goal. But if I'm in a rut, like I'm not even going to the gym rut. And I, so, and I haven't motivated myself to get back in the swing of things. Um, my best advice is actually starting like with hardly anything, which that is n new to even me like that. The front half of my career and training, um, I was very all or nothing where now I've had multiple times since we've done the show where I've kind of fallen off the wagon, where I've fallen off consistency. Even I've strung some weeks together. I mean, I just came off of being sick and, uh, and moving and had probably two weeks where I didn't train. And so after something like that happens, I actually set a very low bar. Like I'm just going to get in and squat today. You know, that's all, that's all I'm going to hold myself to is to get yeah. in and to just a squat or, Hey, I'm just going to go do the elliptical for, you know, 15, 20 minutes and do some ab stuff that I know I need to do. Or I, I've been neglecting mobile. I'll pick just like one or two things that I know I need to do and just do that versus telling myself I need to get like, I need to get re-motivated and I need all this momentum and I need to go get a hard workout in because I know I've been off. I, it won't take much to set a positive si signal. So I'll actually set the bar really low. So I know I'll accomplish it because what happens a lot of times when I'm in a rut where I've been inconsistent in the gym and I'm trying to re-motivate myself to get back. And I'm like, Oh, what program of map should I follow now? Let me go follow map strong. And then I look at the workout. And it's like, Oh, do I really feel like doing all that right now? And a lot of times I'll talk myself out of that. So, and in the past, that's how it was for me. It was either that or nothing where now, again, I'll just, I'll pick one exercise. I'll just say, Hey, I'm going to go in and do circus presses. And many times when I do that, it leads to more exercises, but I'm okay with the possibility that I might just do that one exercise and I might we'll leave the gym and then I'll build on that as, as time goes on. Yeah. We, one of the reasons why we, we've created so many different maps programs, you know, obviously one of the reasons was because there's a lot of different people out there, different goals, but it's also for people who, cause our goal with the podcast, one of our goals is to, to help people develop kind of this lifelong relationship with fitness where, it's something that they always value. They always do because we know the, the the value that it brings to your entire life. And so we have all these different MAPS programs. Part of the reason why we do is so that you could go from one to another to another. Mm -hmm. Like literally, if you start with one MAPS program and you finish it and you follow the next one and you finish it, we have like, we should have now close to two years worth of workouts kind of laid out for you. And then along those lines, if you feel like you're in a rut, like Adam was saying, MAPS 15 has got to be the best workout answer to that. It's yeah. such a great program specifically for that because Momentum you're- Momentum builder. It, you're, you're committing to 15 minutes a day, which if you add up all that time, it's almost two, hour, two one-hour workouts. So you, it's actually significant. But because it's every day, it's easy to, to develop the skill of, of discipline and consistency because it's a day every single day type of thing. And it's not a huge commitment- Everybody has, most people can do like 15 minutes at a time. So that's a great, agreed, uh, agreed. that's a great program for, for someone in this uh, particular boat. Next question is from Kelsey J. Is it better to do heavy strength phases while in a cut to send the strongest muscle building signal or to do strength endurance phases to better mentally cope with performance dips? Whichever one is going to send a more effective muscle building signal to your body is the one that you should do in a cut. Which by is, the way, which would you make the case or argue is the most novel? That's it. Right. I was just going to say, by the way, what that's you weren't the, doing. That's the same answer if you're trying Previously, to bolt. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> it's the same answer. So if you always <clears throat> in a strength phase and then you're about to cut, then you could go into a higher rep, you know, type workout because it's novel and it's yeah. going to send a they lot. They both of, build muscle. You know? They do. Right. So the, the goal is when you're in a cut uh, is to preserve as much muscle as possible, which means the program that's going to build the most muscle is going to be the most effective which means the one that's going to be the most novel to your body within the context of muscle building programs. I, don't, I want to say that because 
people might go extreme with novelty and be like, well, I've oh. never done Pilates, you know, but that's okay. That doesn't really build muscle. So whatever within the context of building muscle is the most novel. I used to always do this with my clients. We're going into a cut. We're going to change your routine. So you're going to get that novel muscle building signal while we cut calories. And that should result in, in, in preserving I mean, muscle. There's some benefits. So like, well, I, I tend to lean obviously more towards like the strength driven uh, workouts, but like to then switch into more hypertrophy, like, you know, higher rep, it's psychologically better for me in a cut because now I'm not like dealing with like the performance weights and like, you know, yeah. like trying to kind of like hero my way through the workouts. I can actually kind of pick weights that are appropriate and, and not feel like, um, you know, I, I would, if I was in a cut doing a strength phase. Next question is from Rachel CG12. When working on squats, is it better to focus more on going heavier with good form or focus more on going deeper into my squat slowly and controlled? Well, both of them, both of those will result in improvement on your squat. So yeah. getting, adding more weight and, and perfecting form would be progress, uh, having the same weight but going deeper in your squat would also equate to so long as your form is good and pro, yeah yeah right obviously right yeah. unless but, you're a, unless you're a power lifter and you're already hitting depth so then what matters most is adding weight i would make the argument that the second one is going to be better for you cuz it's going to build as much muscle as the first option mm -hmm. it's less risky because you're not adding more weight right. it's more functional it's better it's so again so long as you do it properly for your joints um, better form and in, in a better range of motion is where I'll lean towards well, versus it's going a little more weight. foundational in terms yeah. of like being able to build off of that and then r reach sort of a pinnacle of now I can, uh, really focus more on adding load to then increase, uh, the potential of this, this exercise. But yeah, I think too, in terms of functional, um, translation, like having the pursuit of being able to get a little more depth, uh, does make sense uh, for all kinds of other different pursuits. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I strongly agree, um, but I also recognize I have a bit of a bias. Like um, getting a ass to grass squat did so much for me, not just leg development wise, which that was great. Uh, more importantly, like I had bursitis in my hips for years. Yeah, it was gone. Gone. It's gone now. No, I haven't had that ever. And I haven't so done, wild and yeah. th and I have and I also had I always had hip you flexor no stuff going on. I had low yeah. back issues. I had all these stuff, all the stuff that uh, would be going around uh, with it, coming around with my my hips and low back. When I increased my squat depth and got to a place where I comfortably can sit all the way down and squat, I've never had any issues ever again. So. If, for that reason, I'm extremely biased too. If I had to choose with a client, hmm. which one of these are we going to do? And I know how much it's made a personal impact on, on my, so definitely if you're somebody who has issues like that, like increasing the range of motion and cause really all what, what that did was it increased my, the stability and strength in my hips, mm -hmm. the stability and strength in, in my hips and increased range of motion alleviated all the uh, back pain and bursitis in my hips. So work the the things that I did to work on that were so valuable to me. And then on top of that, the side benefit was I'm able to squat less weight and have as much leg development or more than what I had with squatting yeah. more weight. So, yeah. Come, you know, total, uh, uh, you know, complete disclosure too. O obviously we, we give advice and we're on podcasts. That doesn't necessarily mean we always follow it ourselves. <laughs> I'm one of these because, <laughs> you know, uh, my ego gets in the way and it's time and effort uh, to work on uh, things like improving squat mobility and stuff. So, you know, I probably definitely, actually probably, I should work on working on my mobility and depth. What do I end up doing when I squat typically? Well, if I could squat just below parallel, I'm going to go heavier. And this is how I tend to do it myself. Um, so it, it's definitely, uh, I, I know what the challenge is. The challenge is, can I add more weight to the bar, especially when I'm getting close to a PR mm -hmm. or should I work on formal mobility? Trainer Sal which is the smarter Sal says, do the form in the depth, uh, workout Sal, which is the, not a smart Sal says, add some weight, add some weight to the bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's more fun. Next question is Fulvio Castle. What can I do to improve my gut health without supplements? Elimination diet. Yeah. Style. I would go elimination diet to start with. Yeah. Um, so the, the, and this can be different from person to person, but the most common offenders 
would be process, heavily processed foods, um, uh, egg whites, dairy, mm -hmm. gluten, mm -hmm. um, legumes, and I think that's it. I think those are the main ones. Avoid those and see if you notice improvements. And then if you do, then slowly reintroduce them one at a time. So you introduce one of them for a week. See if you notice anything. If it's okay, then then go with the next one. And then I would also include in that list foods that you think you already have, that you notice that you have issues with. And then an, another thing you could do is don't eat frequently. So you're probably better off giving yourself long breaks in between meals. This is for people with gut issues. Mm -hmm. And also giving yourself like three hours at least before going to bed. So yes. eat and then go to bed three that hours. That's the direction I was going to go. It was more digestive um, yeah. help in terms of, you know, doing that 10 minute walk after your big meals, um, you know, chewing your food like to the oh, full degree, yes. you know, like which is something that's always overlooked and just like, really old, uh, you know, grandma wisdom, but, uh, to be able to, and, and also too, like, I, I remember Paul check talking about this and I've tried to kind of implement this, but I used to always have to have a drink with everything I ate and to be able to not rely on the drink to kind of wash it down and it kind of forces you to really take those extra few bites and then being able to kind of bring that in. But like all that stuff matters in terms of like where it starts is, is, you know, the, the digestive process all starts here as you're, as you're, uh, you know, chewing it up. Now that, that's all good free advice that we gave. I, I think there's tremendous value in going to someone like Dr. Cabral and getting tests so they can tell you. Yep. I mean, what you guys all suggested were like ways that this person could, you know, for free kind of troubleshoot or potentially improve their gut. Um, but if this is an area that you know you have issues and you want to improve it. Um, I'm glad I, you said that. I think getting yeah. tested from someone like that is extremely, because then it's just a matter of disciplining yourself to avoid those things. Yeah. Because to be honest with you, more often than not, the stuff that people need to avoid uh, are the foods they eat a lot of. And so they, they try to do all these little things, chewing more, all the, the stuff you guys are talking about, but yet they still are allowing this food in their, in their diet that is disrupting their gut. And so understanding what those foods are, I think are extremely valuable. So going through like the stool test with him, I, I would advise that if, you know, if, well, if here's, you're willing here's, to invest in that. Here's more to that, Adam. Um, if you're finding that all of a sudden you have like all these food intolerances, uh, I guess you could avoid, you know, six different categories of right, foods right. or eat a low FODMAP diet for the rest of your life. Or you can figure out why the hell all of a sudden you've got all these food intolerance right, issues. Right. And, and that's what going to a functional medicine practitioner like Dr. Stephen Cabral's team, that's what they'll do because- I, you know, I'm, I'm a prime example. I did, you know, elimination diet and I had like egg whites, peanuts, uh, dairy, um, legumes. I mean, I remember there was, like the cat, there was like a whole list of foods that I couldn't eat. And it was like, I had to uh, gluten, right? I had to avoid them for so long. But then when I finally realized that I had a, a SIBO that wasn't undiagnosed and treated and some parasite issues, right. when I worked on those, almost all those food intolerances disappeared. Mm-hmm. The only one I'm left with is dairy, but I had dairy since I was a kid. So that's more of a, you know, it's something I don't, I think that's just with me. So you want to figure out the root cause. What you don't want to do, and a lot of people, I know a lot of people like this, where they never figure out the root cause. So their diet becomes more limited, more limited, more limited, more limited. And then they have this really limited diet just to kind of manage what's going on. But the reason why they're so limited is because they have some undiagnosed root cause issue. So you can solve it. They're actually very successful mm -hmm. at solving these issues. It's not like it used to be where you were just stuck trying to figure it out on your own and, and like what the hell is going on type of deal. Look, if you like Mind Pump, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram, Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram, Mind Pump Adam. And guess who's back on Instagram? I am. And I think what is what is my Instagram? Mind, mind pump to Stefano. Mind pump to Stefano. That should have been, been our shout out today. Mind pump to Stefano. You can find me on Instagram now at mind pump to Stefano. A little bit more, you know, censored. I'm not gonna get kicked off again. But same fun stuff and uh, good uh, fitness advice. Go check it out. 
Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 